It feels like we, we as as Americans and in America, we we just woke up to um, Formula One and racing in the United States. Obviously, you you've been doing this for a long time. What do you think are the the key contributors to the popularity of the sport growing in the United States right now? Well, I mean, I've been doing it a long time. I've been here for 15 years. The first couple of years we raced in um, Indianapolis, but it was a very small following. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the, the, the reason for it is that we have, it's a global sport, but we only have one race in each country. And uh, the often the thing that I would hear is that, you know, you have to wake up so early to watch a Grand Prix here. It's mm-hmm. just like at mm-hmm. 3 or 4 a.m. or something crazy. And um, people's, uh, that doesn't work for people, particularly if they got work the next day. So right. um, I think, but what's, I think what's been a huge transition for us is through the pandemic, obviously people were watching Netflix a lot mm-hmm. more. Um, and then there was the, te- the the Netflix show, Drive to Survive, which really, really skyrocketed the, the, the sport into a different realm, really. And now all of a sudden, you've got all these amazing sporting fans that are, that are here in the States and now starting to catch on and get excited about it. So that's refreshing for me because I've, I, I used to come out here and I'd always have to talk about it and people just not understanding. <laughs> uh, they're like, Oh, is that NASCAR? And I'm like, no, it's so much different to NASCAR. Um, although NASCAR is great, but it's just a different form of racing. Right. You know, so funny is you talk about that Netflix show and kind of during the pandemic, you know, my interest in the sport grew, right? We knew much about you, but the sport itself and you got behind the scenes and the technology that, it, that gets involved mm. in the sport, it's amazing. And the amount of money that's being spent on it. Yeah. If if I'm talking to a younger version of myself who doesn't know anything about it, what are some of the things I should be looking for to understand the whole sport of Formula One. I mean, I, it's very, very complex, our mm-hmm. sport. Uh, it's the technology. I think things that, if you're looking for the human side of things, it's it's uh, that we are athletes training a very similar similar vein to NFL basketball players. Um, the races are almost two hours long. You can lose up to 10 pounds in the race. Um, it's, it's very, very physical. Uh, it's basically like... It's like a, f- a fighter jet on wheels, mm-hmm. and um, it's all made of crazy, amazing components that would be also be in like a space shuttle. So, our team could build a rocket if they if that was their goal. The other thing is that it's it's ten teams uh, with two cars, all fighting for two championships: a team championship and a drivers championship. The drivers championship is kind of the the glory championship and the team championships mm-hmm. really about a huge amount of people working towards a common goal. So in my team, there's 2,000 people. Um, two, and then there's... Two, you said 2,000? Yeah, there's actually over 2,000 people now <laughs> just to, to build two cars. So yeah, it's... it's um, and you know everybody by name, I'm sure. Uh, no, <laughs> no, because they're all switching out. It's a bit yeah. a bit like in the NFL, for example. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I was just at the... Uh, at, at the, Bronco. uh, the Broncos game yeah, yeah. in LA, but just just no, learning more and more about the NFL, just how players are switched out so often mm-hmm. through a season, mm-hmm. and it's very very similar for us with with engineers and designers. They're they're being traded, not being traded as such, but they're being chased by other teams. You know, wow. the other teams want right. you know our aer- aerodynamicist or um, our tire guy. You know, right, so right. Um, and otherwise, the crazy things is that we do. Uh, over 200 miles an hour pretty much every lap but it's not about the speed in the straight line because that's the one particularly here in the states everyone asks what's the top speed right two, we do 200 miles an hour easy it's like just not even a thing for us so <laughs> it's not even something that we really think about it's it's more about the at the high speeds that we can take corners at like 180 miles an hour and when you turn, the car is on rails and your body wants to go in the opposite direction. So that's the G-force that we pick up. Um, and then it's the wheel-to-wheel battles we have at those high speeds. Like you're doing 180, 200 miles an hour down the straight and you're battling with people and it's split-second decisions. As the excitement grows and statewide, you, you do spend a lot of your free time here in the States um, from your recording studios or even training and you snowboard from what I understand. Um, are you happy to see the sport growing and you doing more work here and more races being done in the United States? 
I mean, well, firstly, we don't get a lot of downtime. The season is from February all the way to December. Um, so, and then you still have commitments pretty much till like the 16th of December. And then, so you then get your period off for Christmas and then you're back into training through January, uh, for the season. Uh, but I do spend as, like as much as I, if I can make my work mm -hmm. happen over here, I, I really love being in the States as a kid. I would sit in front of the TV and just watch all these movies like Brewster's Millions and uh, Eddie Murphy's like my, you know, a huge hero of mine. I love Eddie. And so all of his movies like Boomerang and Training Places and um, oh, those, were, are, those are the clean Eddie Murphy. Yeah, 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 exactly. movies, yeah, yeah. But they're all like, you know, I remember just watching these or, or, or Scrooge, you know, watching the movies in New York. New York was the dream place for me to go. So when I was 17, my mom for my 17th birthday, my mom saved up and took me t to New York for a few days. And that was like, at the time, one of the best trips we'd done. So I'd been out to Albuquerque, I'd been uh, driven up to Vegas. And so in my winters, I spend my winter often in Colorado. Snow is the best really there. Um, and then I love getting out to New York or it's California if I can. Um, but I think it's great that we have more and more races here because there is such a this huge growth uh, in America for the, and uh, a, a huge like uh, thirst for this sport now mm -hmm. and we need to have it happening more here for people to get more and more used to it if you're just having that one event a year then it's it's like a peak moment and then it dies for mm -hmm. a whole year and so when we have a few of them through the year it just it brings more excitement more eyeballs um, and uh, more youth getting into the sport and the youth the youth is they're big that's big for you let's talk more about um, the youth and your mission 44. Can you tell me a little bit about that organization? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm 37. I've been racing for 30 years. Jeez. Um, and I've been professional for 15 and my dad and I, we were the only people of color still to this day. We only generally the only people, black people at least, uh, but very, very few people of color, for example, within the industry. And, Year on year, when I would ask, when I'm amongst the, the team of 2,000 people, when I would ask why, why am I the only person of color in the in the room, um, or, or how comes you're not hiring many people of color? Why is it not diverse? There was never really an answer for it, and they didn't they didn't know what the barriers were. Mm -hmm. So I set up a a commission which was set out to, a research base to set out um, to try and find out what those barriers were for 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 young youth from diverse backgrounds, um, from low socioeconomic backgrounds, mm -hmm. and just generally disadvantaged kids trying to get into STEM subjects, which then is a pathway into, into engineering in the sport. And so with that, I was able to present the findings of that to my sport and say, hey, th these are the issues and these are the things that we can do. Mm -hmm. There was 10 recommendations. And alongside that, I didn't want it just to be a bit, a bit of research and it just to sit there on the shelf. So I am someone generally of just like, I'm as an athlete, like, as you know, just someone about action. So I just decided to start um, a nonprofit organization called Mission 44. And that's focused on um, really changing, trying to transform the lives of young youth that are faced with uh, uh, disadvantage and discrimination. Um, at, whether it's at, at, through education or in, at work uh, and really trying to empower them to become future leaders. I don't want to just be a uh, provider service for the team anymore. I was like, what can we do to create impact? Yes, it's all great going and winning races and being champions and that, but we've got to really lead in um, our, our fight for DNI mm. um, within our industry, within our team. Mm -hmm. We've got to improve within our team but we've got a plan for the future and it's really getting young youth in, uh, again, just improving those pipelines into our sport. Yeah, I love that. I think even for myself, you know, growing up in New York City, I, I, I struggle with that, right? As a football player, it's a little different because my team has diversity built in, but sure. you know, in an upper echelons of corporate America where I'm at now, sometimes I'm the only one in the room. Absolutely. Let's, let's go back one step though. Where did you get the courage to speak up about you being the only one in the room? How, where did you get that courage from? Um, I think partly it's ingrained in, in who I am. I've, I've never been really good at 
adhering to kind of um, rules. Um, if someone tells me I can't do something, I would always be about proving them wrong. Um, I think really I, I over, I think, you know, when I first, the dream was to get to Formula One. As we kind of slipped through the cracks somehow and we got there, the only black family uh, there, I think the goal was obviously to win world titles. But when we got there, we thought that we, you know, we, we aspired to do something like the Williams sisters or, you know, like Tiger. We watched those on TV mm -hmm. and thought, oh, wow, they've broken the mold. And maybe now they've broken the mold, more young people will get in, which they did. Mm -hmm. And we thought that maybe by us doing that, it would also create change in that space. And then I got like 10 years in and I realized I'd been asking these questions, but I was, it was, it's a very, very touchy subject and it was very difficult to, you know, there wasn't, no one really truly understands. So it will kind of generally not shut that, get shut down, but it was just a really difficult line to walk as well as, you know, trying to keep your job. And, yeah, exactly. Um, I think for me it was, but then obviously things were building up over time. I was seeing what was happening over here. Uh, the real transition moment for me was w with what happened with George mm -hmm. and George Floyd. And just over time, you're seeing more and more of the violence that was happening over here. Mm -hmm. It really hit home for me um, as it did for, I'm sure, for so many people. But for me, it brought up a lot of my past that I just suppressed, basically, the experiences I had in the UK. Like, we don't have the same gun violence that you have over mm -hmm. here in the States, but there's still discrimination all over the world. And um, black people face very, very, um, I would say they're different, but in many ways similar in terms of obstacles, in terms of getting uh, good education, getting uh, great jobs. Like you're talking about within uh, your industry, how the higher up you go up the pyramid, the yeah. less it's diverse. And that's very much the same in my sport. Although we don't have, there's not many of us, only 20 drivers. So it's not like uh, you have a whole team of us uh, servicing a team. And my goal is really to, to change that in the future. I think a diverse team is always, uh, it has been proven to be better for an organization. Mm -hmm. It's better for, for idea creation, creativity, and um, it shows that there's, there's better performance for, for a team um, when it's more diverse. But it starts with education and um, encouraging young youth and letting them know that there is an actual opportunity. Like young black kids in England particularly don't think that there's a role for them because they don't see some of them on, when they're watching the Grand Prix, for example, they don't see someone that looks like them. So they're like, there's no way I can be there. Um, for me, uh, when I was watching Formula One when I was five, I didn't see anybody that was black, but, and, and that could have uh, hindered me, but it was still my dream. Um, and luckily I had my dad who supported me there. Now, how do you think from a corporate sense, um, your efforts are being viewed, even both um, at home in, in London and, and here in the United States, and from a corporate sense, how is it something that you felt like you had to, to fight to get this initiative going, or it was something that everyone said, you know what, I think it's time? I think it's, I think just getting into sport was a fight. I think getting people to listen for sure was a fight. That's, I think that's the same for many, many people. Um, what I've been really grateful about is I got signed when I was 13 by Mercedes. Um, when I sat down with them in 2020 and said, look, we have to do more. We, we, we've got to make a stand. We've got to, I have a responsibility and I want to let the black community know that I hear them, I stand with them and I'm going to do something about, do something as, do as much as I can with the platform and the opportunity I have. So we changed our car from silver. Mercedes had never changed their car from silver to black in 2020. And I won the seventh world title that year mm -hmm. in the black car, which was really quite phenomenal for us as a team. Um, then, for example, as a team, my boss and everyone had, we went through diversity and inclusion uh, training, all, every single one of us did it. Um, my team, when we were on the grid, my team took the knee with me, um, which is all, at the time, was all generally white at the, at the track, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone was very, very open-minded and super supportive. Mercedes has now got um, several initiatives like Accelerate 25, which is trying to improve, get the team from, it was like 
two or three percent diversity to twenty five percent within five years.、Mm. Um, we've started, as I said, in, as part of the last contract, we started、um, an organization called Ignite, which I help fund, they help fund, Mercedes help fund,、mm -hmm. and that's again trying to improve the representation within our sport. One of the things is trying to get eight thousand young girls into our sport because again, there's not many. Um, not enough women within our industry,、mm. um, and and then I've had huge support and a great reception from the whole industry as a whole.、Um, like trying to get all the teams to sign a charter,、mm -hmm. so that they also go and do the work and the research and improve the diversity within their teams. So, but of course you still get it. Like there's still sometimes a little bit of、um, pushback,、mm -hmm. but it's really I realize it's really about creating allies. It's really about、um, Just creating that understanding and taking people on the journey with you. Love it. Love. It. Sounds like you have a lot on your plate, right?、Yeah. You're you're a driver. You big into diversity and inclusion, but、um, you also care about the environment really well, right? You're into sustainable technologies. Again, a man that has so much on his plate, you you don't have any downtime, right? You've corrected me already on <laughs> that.、Um, how do you fit that part also, like caring about the environment? Why is that important to you? Well, look, I've been、uh, like everyone. I grew up a relatively normal life. I raced two thirds of my life, and I remember when I got to this sport. For sure, diversity diversity wasn't,、uh, and particularly、uh, sustainability was not at the top of anybody's list.、Mm -hmm. Any industry,、um, it was a. We also recycle paper, you know,、mm -hmm. and it was at the bottom of the list, and it's becoming up more and more and more. Of, of importance for industries. I think for me, I started to look at how I was living my life and the impact that I was having on the planet, and trying to think as to how I can just try and leave the place a, a better place than what、I've, what we found it.、Mm -hmm. And so I realized that there's a that we need more and more people to be investing in new technologies.、Um, And so I would ask the team, for example, you know, we go. It's a huge circus to go to 23 different countries throughout the year, taking 100 people per team, pretty much, to all these different places. Hundreds of thousands of people turn up to races. The the, the amount of waste that there are on those circuits, the travel, everything, and looking at ways that we can offset that. Looking at ways in which we can,、uh, for example, and just holding really difficult conversations,、yeah. and not letting it just be a We also do, you know, also working on sustainability, and we're also working pushing for diversity, and not actually seeing action in the background. So, I feel that my responsibility, with particularly with the platform now I have, is to keep my kind of my foot on the gas and make sure <laughs> not on the yeah, gas, fun, but you know what I mean, on, on the on the neck or whatever it is, <laughs> right, you know,、right. to just to make sure that people are held accountable. People are really doing what they they do. So I, when I'm in touch with the The CEO、uh, of our sport. I'll ask him, sir, how's it going? What are you doing? What? How can I support you? Are you really doing? You know, like I ask questions that they probably wouldn't normally get asked, maybe. And then just getting people to care. We need more and more compassion in the world. We need more and more people. To, it's not about being perfect, but one thing I think, and I'm sure you're already going to ask, but one thing we already have taken, for example, this year we have we're using 10% biofuels. Our team, Mercedes, is the first global、um, team, I believe, to、uh, cut its global emissions by by fifty percent.、Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, for example, is、uh, using. You know, we have those teams、uh, traveling to those different races, so we've cut down、um, our carbon emissions by using、uh, biofuels for flights, aviation、mm -hmm. fuel.、Um, I've been plant based for six years, so. I don't、uh, eat anything with a mother. I I don't use single use plastics. I like I've changed so much within my、uh, space, but I, of course I still race cars. But the problem is, if I stop, the sport will still go. Someone will just replace me,、right. and the sport will still go. So, what can I do whilst I'm here? And that's that's just really pushing for those changes. I love that, and I feel like you you probably called our CEO because like the sustainable. Investing platform that we have now has just taken off, and we're really getting behind that. Um, you, you talk more about about all the different platforms you have. Do you ever feel like it's it's getting too much to ask these questions, or get uncomfortable for you? Or are you happy in the position that you're in to be able to do that? 
I would say when I was younger, it was uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, um, you know, bit by bit, you try and test your luck, you, you try and push. But honestly, for me, it was like I was racing in Formula One every year I was having success and I was thinking, geez, why me? Why is it, you know, not one of the other young black kids that I grew up with in the street? Um, or one of the other 19 drivers having the success I was having. And I was trying to f- understand how and why, what my purpose is here. Why, why me? Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized that it's for a much, it's for a much bigger, it's the, the bigger picture. It's much more than winning championships. And mm-hmm. it's about inspiring young people. It's about, um, showing people that there is, that we are, we limit ourselves. There's not, there are no limits. Mm-hmm. Um, it's encouraging people out there to, to be outspoken, to not care what people think of how they look, you know, be yourself Mm -hmm. and also just encourage people out there to, to chase their dreams. You know, like every single one of us has dreams Yeah. and, um, you know, I was just very, very fortunate to have had the support and we had a lot of hard work to get where we we were. But I think now I'm happy 2020 was taking the knee, for example, was was a nerve wracking moment. Man. It's like, geez, this. But I like, I have to do this. This is, this is one of the most. This is the most important moment in my life. And if I don't do this, then I just, I, I'll be letting myself down. I'll be letting my community down. And and so, but I I remember doing that and then having support from my team that I wasn't expecting. Yeah. And then the steps we've taken since then have been great. I mean, you, you're you're an impressive man, and I think the the thing I like to focus on in my role here at UBS is, is legacy, and you've created that. You know, you're the greatest of all time in my eyes, and in most people's eyes, you're the best. Out of all of your accomplishments, you've done so many things. What would be the one accomplishment that stands out for you? I think the thing that I'm so far most proud of is starting Mission Forty Four. Um, because I'm so, so fortunate to be able to, uh, to be where I am, to work with amazing people of whom I would never have got to where, where I am without the incredible support of the team, of my family. But there is no greater feeling than helping people and thinking about like the young me that's out there today who's facing certain barriers and and there's you know when i was younger i don't apart from my dad i didn't really have necessary apart from Nelson mandela for example but mm-hmm. i didn't necessarily have anybody that was trying to create a better path for me apart from him and so but there's still a long way to go i'm only 37 i'm st- i've only just started this yeah, you're just a baby and so <laughs> just a baby. i don't know if I'm a baby <laughs> but you know and i think there's there's a long road ahead. There's a huge amount of work to do, but I'm more infused, more more uh, encouraged because I'm seeing a lot of other people starting to do the work as well. You know, for example, there there are other industries that are, the conversation of DNI is now a serious topic. Um, more and more industry uh, companies are are doing more work there. Um, but yeah, I would say that you know, winning championships is a great thing, but. Yeah, I think this is this is something far greater, far bigger, and far more impactful. And in like ten, five, ten, fifteen years, that's the thing that I'm going to be most proud of when I see when I look back on the sport and start to see it more diverse. Yeah, I agree. I think those things are, at the end of the day, the true legacy, right? Yeah, records can be broken, and now we're talking about somebody else. But the impact that you have on people's lives last uh, a long period of time. Definitely. So. Again, so I'm going to have to ask you, since we've talked about your Mission 44, give me the on the track accomplishment that you just, when you, when you sleep at night, you're like, wow, I did that. Um, when I think about, when I think about racing, I think about my, f- like my first win, like getting to, f- just getting to Formula One, walking out the garage the first day and seeing my dad smile, you know, the mm-hmm. sacrifices that, that my dad had to go through to get me there are unmeasurable. And then winning my first Grand Prix and seeing him at the bottom of the podium, like, yes, mm-hmm. like we did it. Um, 
after all those sleepless nights, all the, sh- the tears and, and the, what we shed over time. So, mm. of course, winning seven world titles, I don't really think about my championships. Um, I just think about those special moments with, with my family, oh, you know, because wow. that that's what, how it really started. It was us driving around the country in, the, uh, in our Vauxhall Cavalier with a trailer. At one stage, we went to like an RV mm-hmm. and sleeping in, or sleeping in tents and stuff. On you know, there was a family outing each weekend, and my dad also was on the receiving end of discrimination throughout the time, uh, as he didn't know what he was doing. It was like trying to. Mm-hmm. So I think that's probably the thing that I we are, I am most proud of, and we I think would be most proud of. And when a young Lewis Hamilton looks at his or her career and wanting to, to race, what would you want them to take from your journey through the sport? Um, to, I think I would want them to remember to be fearless. Um, and I hope they know that education is prior, is, has to be the main priority. That's the foundation of everything. When I'm working with a team of 2000 people being able to communicate with all these universities and, you know, genius engineers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm fortunate that I had good support in that space. Um, but just that nothing is impossible. That's what I really want young kids to know that nothing is impossible. Nothing can get in your way mm-hmm. or don't let anything get in your way. Um, if you want it, you've got to put in the work. It's going to take hard work. Listen to your parents because they do always know better. Which you know is the truth. Yeah, that's that's great. And I, I think the the thing that I, I love about what you talk about is, you know, the the memories and the 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 relationships that you created through the sport. And it does bring communities together. Definitely. And as you look back at your career and obviously we have young eyes looking at you. What would you tell that young person that's thinking about coming into your sport and tell them why you're doing this stuff off the track? Why is that as important to you as these championships? Uh, it's, well, it's literally because you, I know I, all of a sudden you have this platform. Now you have a platform. Now you have a voice. What is it you want to do with your voice? I want to be, I want to help change the world. Uh, along with the many millions of people that are doing amazing work. Um, I think uh, bringing people together. We live in a more divided time than it seems than ever Mm -hmm. in the world. And we need to be drowning out those that are trying to divide us more and bringing people together. I think luckily sport does bring people together. Nelson Mandela says that sport has the power to change the world and I think that sport really does have um, when you see concerts or when you see particularly these races and you see people sitting next to each other from supporting different teams but from different backgrounds but come together and have an amazing weekend um, you, you, I've met people that have been going through cancer and what the races have helped them like about get through the painful moments mm-hmm. and so it's there's a huge power within the sport there's a huge power within the platform and I, and I want to use it for good. You talk about Nelson Mandela a few times today. I know he means a lot to everyone. Yep. I mean, he's a global icon. Um, let's shrink it just a bit from, from a British standpoint. Is there any black um, activists or, or leaders that you could have looked up to when you, besides your dad, but you could looked up to when you were coming up the ranks? Uh, for me, it was uh, Ali. Uh, I got a book, a, the autobiography of Nelson Mandela when I was a, when I was a kid and my dad was always pushing me to read. So I remember reading this book on Nelson Mandela and just idolizing him. Mm-hmm. Just like, wow. And I had the honor of meeting him. But knowing his story, I, I take so many lessons from, from him. I think one of the most, most important lessons is how humble he was when he came out of prison after being wrongfully imprisoned for 26 years and he came and had uh, when and had tea with the man that put him away and was able to forgive. I just find that incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, and then just what he did for people, just, uh, he was such a bright light. And I think we all are 
bright, shining lights, you know? And I think there's that great quote from Maya Angelou, she's like, who are we to have to dim our light to make the person next to you feel better? And then the thing, you gotta shine as bright as you can, smile mm -hmm. and be as big and bright and bold as you can to encourage the person next to you to wanna do the same. Love it. Listen, I, I am completely honored to be sitting here with you. I asked if we could have brought a real goat in here to sit with us during the interview. They wouldn't allow it <laughs> because uh, you're the greatest of all time. Um, and, but it's not just what you do on a track. It's evident by the way you move your day to day and the way you look at life and the way you inspire others. Um, I'm older than you, but I can say that you inspire me. So now you look young, dude. Yeah, listen. Yeah. <laughs> I eat well. Good. Uh, I'm not on your diet yet, but uh, I do yeah. tend to eat well. But thank you so much for being with us and um, much success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.